All right, so today I wanted to talk about trustworthy in machine learning in complex environments. And I wanted to start by saying that we live in a world of information deluge. Even the smartest of us can find ourselves really overwhelmed by the highly dynamic and massive data streams we'll have to keep up with in order to make informed decisions. Well, whether it's our everyday life of driving at a very busy traffic junction, or it is you know, a decision making healthcare and medicine that concerns our high priority needs, or even in a very extreme case, the command and control in um, you know, a multi-domain modern battle space. So there is an urgent need for us to develop, develop machine learning algorithms to augment intelligence uh, for trustworthy interactive decision-making. So today I'll talk about a wish list of trustworthy machine learning models. And specifically I'll focus on robustness, efficiency, and ethics. I'll talk about the challenges associated with each of them and our solutions to tackle these challenges. Let's get started with first, you know, we know that there are a lot of challenges in interactive decision making. To start with, I wanted to talk about a vision, right? So I, people talk about real artificial intelligence, but true artificial intelligence. In my vision, I think an artificial intelligence system with minimal superhuman uh, supervision has to interact with the environment, get some feedback from the environment, make a decision, and then try to, you know, um, reinforce your decision and make it better and better, right? So trained from scratch, these kind of agents or sometimes we call it RL agents are often suboptimal in terms of exploration because you know you need to understand the world, it takes too long and the agent may expose to danger, right? What's even worse is that if, you know, let's say you spend a week training in robots just to stand up like a human, you know, maybe it did, but when you see some of out of distribution observation, it all of a sudden fall down, fail again. So, but intuitively, should we always learn from scratch? Think about this example that let's say you've trained a patrol robot it, with infrared sensors on a battlefield during the daytime, it works very good, perfect. But what if you have a sensor upgrade? All of a sudden, you know, rather than infrared sensors, you have camera sensors. And still during the data, I'm still in the same field, but do you want it to train everything from scratch? Right, so now also has the question of, you know, what about during the nighttime, right? So do you also need to train everything from scratch? Right, so we we'll ask this question, but with the desired ability that can we have efficient adaptability to these kind of unseen inputs so that we can speed up learning and finally realize true artificial intelligence. So there is a very popular learning paradigm called seem to real. Essentially what it does is like it tries to train strategy or learn strategy in a simulator where you have full control, you have lots of data, you know, it's very safe, it's an ideal world. But in this ideal world, you learn all these kind of information that it all transfer to the real world where the nature is very unstable. Right, so you always see the sudden differences, the sudden changes, which essentially a distribution shifts in the real world. How do you deal with that? So the problem of the sim to real is one thing that I really wanted to understand and what we've been working a lot lately. Now, when the distribution shift has been very extreme, let's say adversarial uh, perturbations, what can happen? So this actually is not very rare. It happens all the time in practice. Indeed, a well-trained agent could very well make wrong decisions under adversarial attacks, even if this adversarial perturbation is really, really small. Actually, in my presentation today, I will talk about very surprising cases. You will see how these machine learning agents may be so vulnerable to very small perturbations. So, you know, a very famous example, you guys have seen the panda picture, adding a very little imperceptible noise becomes a gibbon with high probability, high confidence in a neural network that is very well trained, right? With that, because neural networks, oftentimes the backbone of this decision makers, then do you really trust this decision making when you're doing self-driving? Right? What about healthcare? These are all high stakes tasks. You don't want to put your life in danger by just trusting something that is not very robust. So there is a very, you know, very much high desire to have robustly behave 
agents under even adversarial inputs. And finally, I wanted to call attention to this ethical issues in machine learning. So when we develop models, you oftentimes the high priority is not making it ethical, right? We always look at the utility and the efficiency, but oftentimes ignore how important it is because when the machine learning is deployed, it should be in service of human. And when human is in the loop, you always want to make sure that the models actually confirm to the social norms. So today I'll also talk about some recent work in this direction. So this is a very um, you know, kind of uh, uh, recent three years, a kind of summarization of my group's contribution to these three aspects in order for trustworthy machine learning. And I'll first start with robustness, and then I'll talk very briefly about efficiency, maybe in five minutes. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about ethics, um, but I also wanted to say, not only we wanted to address these problems for each of the single direction, we're well, also thinking that can we um, you know, address some of them simultaneously, maybe even ultimately all three of them simultaneously. All right, so let's get started. Let's start from, again, a very cute robot here. Uh, again, I, as I said, uh, in most of the existing RL algorithms, when you have a new state or a new environment, you often learn from scratch. And this is Nevertheless, this is never how humans learn, right? When humans see a new state and new environment, we always go back to our history, whatever you've observed in your entire life, right? So, and you wanted to find some similarities between the new thing and whatever you've accumulated as common knowledge, and then find the similarities and essentially transfer the knowledge from what you've learned to this very new state and environment, okay? So for example, if you've tried a strawberry donut and a mint cookie and you love them both, then you probably would have an educated guess about what a mint donut would be taste like, right, as a human. So human is very good at learning by analogy. Then the question I wanted to answer is, can we make RL agents also be very good at learning by analogy? And the answer is yes. I'm gonna show you first. This learn by analogy can be done in the very different levels of learning, starting from a single task learning. You can imagine during a single task learning, the world has all these kind of explored and unexplored states. You know, the existing work would be, okay, I should encourage you to explore the unexplored because you need to know the world to make informed decisions. But that is inevitably inefficient because you have to explore the entire world. So the idea here is, can I rather than go directly to explore the unexplored states, can I do knowledge transfer, right? Can I transfer the knowledge that I know in the explored states to the unexplored states and essentially make the learning much more efficient, right? So this is like a very nice contribution in terms of a theoretically reduced computational complexity, simple complexity in the world of model-based reinforcement learning algorithms. But this level of knowledge transfer does not only happen in single tasks, can also happen in multiple tasks. For example, let's say you've learned all these kind of simpler tasks in the smaller observation space. Now, can you also do you know, faster learning in the very larger state space with a larger environment, which is much more challenging than the previous tasks? Uh, tasks? And the answer is yes, it turns out Although all these kind of underlying MDP models are so drastically different because they're all very different mazes, right? So the underlying MDPs are very different. It's hard to make, uh, find similarities, but we realize that the modular similarities actually exist, right? For example, what you know about a flag should still transfer, right? Even if it's in a new state or new environment, puddle also transfers to puddle. Right, so the kind of smaller kind of uh, modular similarities could still exist, even if your environment has changed drastically, or you could understand it somehow as like the underlying basic laws of physics is still the same. Right, so with that intuition, this becomes the first PAGM DP algorithm for even varying state and action spaces, which was never possible before without knowing more site information. Okay, 
So, but this is all about tabular R. I don't want to go into too much details because I wanted to focus on the more of the state of the art modern uh, machine, uh, you know, deep neural network powered uh, machine learning. So, what about in deep RL, right? When you have a neural network as a backbone as the decision maker, can you still do transfer learning to make things work much better? And indeed, this is echoing my theme of the talk today, which is in complex environments, you have very large observation spaces. So I'm gonna talk about transfer across observation spaces with latent dynamic similarities. The motivation is that the observation space of an RL agent usually changes. And here is an example, is a you know, cartoon example here. Let's say you have a very simple maze. In your source task, you are this agent and you know your location as well as the location of your goal. This is great, right? This basically means that you know you have a very compact representation in your observation space. You can make you know, you can do decision making in a very efficient manner. All right, this is great. But what if in your target task, you happen only to have a top down view of this entire maze, which becomes an image, probably in a very high dimensional space, you can imagine there is a lot of redundant information in that image. So overall becomes a much more challenging task. But wait a second, although the observation spaces are completely different, and therefore, you know, you, in target, you have a very challenging task, but there is some similarities between the underlying dynamics. And essentially, we live in the same planet, right? The basic laws of physics we follow should be the same. So you could imagine as some latent space that you probably don't know, we should have a similar dynamics transition in that space. But what that space is, is like finding the needle in the haystack. Right, so all the spaces you could imagine, you have to find that compact space. That is your representation space. And this is the idea of the talk here, you know, for this, for this part of the work here. So this happens a lot. So you could imagine pastoral robots, as I said, from infrared sensors upgraded to cameras. But you know, you could also imagine with the development of the high technology these days, it may be like a pattern robot with like cameras upgraded to like a 3D camera or even more advanced sensors. Who knows what will come out tomorrow, right? So with that, you wanted to probably, you know, rather than using the existing methods, retrain the entire RO agents when you have like upgraded to a very advanced sensor, you probably could do knowledge transfer. Right, so you could use whatever you've learned from the simpler task and you know, kind of speed up the learning of the harder task, kind of like a curriculum learning flavor, right? With that, I'll tell you how we're doing specifically for this problem. Is the fact of underlying dynamics have not changed, like you know, the underlying laws of physics is still the same. The proposed solution is to regularize the representation learning by transfer to dynamics model. How does this work exactly? So during the source task, you have this state space ST, which is you know, your location, your target location, this vector representation, which is very compact and informative representation. Now, what you do is you go through this encoder, which is everyone does, right? A very standard learning paradigm. Go through encoder, learn a representation, and that representation goes through a decision maker you know, a neural network, which tells you what is the underlying, or what is the policy you should be using so that you, minim you maximize the cumulative return you're getting, right? Seems to be very good, but with a caveat. Indeed, we realized in our paper that a good representation should approximate multiple policy values. This makes a lot of sense. You have to search over all the possible policies, right? If you only work well for one policy, how are you gonna search over all the policies? So, but this is the bad news because all this kind of standard training paradigm concerns only one policy, which is the under, underlying policy you're using. How do you deal with it, right? Does this become a, you know, invisible problem? But the answer is no. You can actually find a detour to it. And this is what we observed. It realized that actually model, better model prediction or dynamics model prediction 
would guarantee that you will have a better representation. This is actually a sufficient condition for you to have a good representation. With that observation, then it seems to be a good news now, right? So rather than being able to find the needle in the haystack for all different policies, all you need to do is to use your representation to fit the dynamics model and see whether your dynamics model is able to perform very well under the specific representation space ZT. And if it is working very well, then this is gonna be a good representation space that you can use. So that's how we kind of, in the source task, use an auxiliary task of doing dynamics model prediction to kind of regulate the representational learning. This is also in line with the current uh, belief in the community that model-based RL is actually the future of RL. That's what I believe, at least for now. Maybe I'll, it will change later. So, but with that, in the target task, what you can do then is, you, because the dynamics model is transferable across this task, then you can simply use the same dynamics model as the regularization to regulate your representation learning in the task, in the target task. And this is very efficient because then in your target task, you can learn the representation with the regularization, with the regularization which help you, uh, you know, guide you through finding the needle in the haystack. Right, so this is really nice. And let's see, empirically also works very well. So we look at this half cheetah agent here. Um, it started with like 17 dimensions, a very compact dimension, right? Representation, which is like a vector representation, a very simple uh, source task. But we tried to, you know, to see whether we're able to use the simple source task to transfer knowledge to a harder task. We tried two situations. The first one is a much higher dimension, 145 dimension, which is a much larger vector representation, but it's a larger dimensional space, right? Whereas the second one, which is from vector representation to pixel representation, which is like a, you know, a complete change of the observation space becomes a much harder problem. You can see for both of the situations, our method is able to speed up training compared with the baselines. The green dashed lines is actually the easier source task learning curve, which you can think about it as a, uh, you know, kind of oracle. You are never able to be better than that. Indeed, because it's just a simpler, easy source task, uh, you cannot be better than that simple task because you are solving a harder target task. But surprisingly, or quite impressively, you can see our method is kind of approaching that oracle in some senses. Right, so this is becoming the first method to achieve a vector to pixel knowledge transfer without any predefined mappings. Now, um, with this knowledge transfer, I probably, as an agent, the agent probably said, okay, because I have good experience with strawberry donut and mint cookie, I probably will take a mint donut. That's good, knowledge transferred. Um, so you can you know, make a decision very fast, but wait a second, look at the mint donut here. There's a little bug there to the agent. It's almost like saying the observation space is perturbed a little bit, maybe very small amount. But this perturbation is like an attacker who's attacking this agent's observation space. And we should be aware of such vulnerability. As I said at the beginning of the talk, if you have such vulnerabilities to small perturbation to your input space, you probably suffer from catastrophic failure, right? Your self-driving car would, you know, go full speed at a stop sign and so on because you didn't recognize this is a stop sign, right? So this is really bad. And we wanted to defend against such vulnerability. So as the old saying goes, if you know yourself and your enemy, you never lose a battle. So let's start by first understanding our enemy. You know, understanding and measuring the vulnerability of our algorithms by studying attacks. And after that, then you're able to evaluate and improve the robustness of our algorithm through defenses. So we'll start with first understanding the enemy. So the goal is to find the strongest attacker efficiently 
for a policy pie, any policy pie, this policy is going to be so called a victim policy, because this is the policy being deployed during test time, which is under attack. Okay, so you want when you wanted to find the strongest possible attacker under some budget. Right, but you also wanted to find it more efficiently because the efficiency is the key. You know, RL algorithms are already so sample expensive, you're not able to find it more efficiently than you are basically looking at an invisible problem. Existing methods, however, are hard to achieve both. You know, they're either optimal or efficient. Most of the times they're efficient, but not optimal, therefore not utilizing the full vulnerability. For example, in a recent paper, we proved that these heuristic-based methods are kind of myopic and non-optimal. You can imagine this is very different from the supervised learning adversarial machine learning because now you have an interactive decision-making process. You have to be having a long vision because what you do is going to affect the future. So, you know, if you have this heuristic-based methods that is very myopic, only making sure that I'm safe for now and doesn't guarantee I'm safe in the future, then this is problematic. And same here, if you utilize the vulnerability of the agent only for one time, not in the future, then this is not the strongest attacker. And do you want to make sure that you can find the strongest attacker possible to understand the vulnerability of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms? Indeed, there is a recent paper proving that optimal attacker is inevitably an RL problem, which is very kind of like bad news because RL problem by itself is a very difficult problem. But it's also kind of intuitive because you're trying to attack an RL uh, policy. Of course, it involves solving an RL problem. So with this observation, they propose an end-to-end -end RL method, which is kind of directly learn a policy that maps the states to the perturbed states. But unfortunately, this might be sample and computationally expensive, especially in the complex environment I'm focusing here, which is usually in a very large observation space, you can see this kind of attacking is not even visible. Actually, uh, we'll show you some examples later on to show how you know, these kind of attacker, although it's optimal, but it's not really visible in a complex environment. So with that, let's find a solution. So we first realize that the state is under attack, as if you have the original state is perturbed to a different state. But one very important observation we realize is that under this victim policy is this perturbation of the state is only adversary because it's gonna perturb your action under this victim policy, as if if my action is preserved, my action is not changed, whatever perturbation to my state, I don't care, right? Because the, finally, the perturbation of the state is to make sure that I, you know, didn't do the right action. I'm like, you know, working on a very bad action for me. So with that observation, we realized that adversarial attackers are just perturbation of the policy. And this is, seems to be a simple kind of, um, you know, the fact, but it, it means a lot in terms of making the entire pipeline to be efficient and visible. Once you realize that our reversal attacks are just perturbation of the policy, you can simply, you know, make it the original problem of finding the adversarial perturbation in the state space that minimizes your uh, return to the maximum degree is equivalent as finding the perturbation of the policy that minimizes your rewards to the maximal degree. And originally this end-to-end -end reinforcement learning attack, which has to be inevitably in this large um, observation space, which therefore is invisible to control the perturbation of the state, can be decomposed into two problems with a very uh, smaller, much smaller RL problem and a non-RL problem. This RL problem is concerning, you know, this perturbation of the policy, which is, you know, interacting with the environment. 
where this non-RL problem doesn't have to interact with the environment. It's simply just the supervised learning problem. So theoretically, we can even prove that the strongest policy attacker is so much easier to identify than the strongest state attacker. Therefore, we have solved this small RL problem to control the perturbation of the actions and therefore reward it back to the state space to find the worst state attacker. Is there a question? Let's see. Uh, they can only see part of the screen. Is that still the case? Okay, all right. But are they able to see the full screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Right. So with that, let's see some empirical results. Um, oh, before that, sorry. Um, so basically, we propose based on that uh, based on that philosophy, we propose an optimal and efficient attack algorithm. We call it policy adversarial actor director. This indeed uh, is very efficient because you know it is in a very smaller action space that you're doing perturbation, but it's also optimal compared with heuristic attacker. You know, the heuristic attackers are efficient, but they're not optimal. Whereas this, you know, optimal attacker is not efficient and finally is not visible in a large observation space. So some empirical results. Very impressively, you can see our attacker is achieving significantly better results than the state, the previous state of the art. Actually, the previous best attacker is kind of like the best of all the existing methods you could imagine. So, you know, maybe for this environment, some method is best for the other environment, another method is best, but we're choosing the one for each environment, the best previous attacker for our comparison. So very impressively, you can see using very small amount of perturbation noise, you get the lowest possible reward in many of these Atari games. These Atari games have image states and discrete actions so that you have very large state space makes this previous you know, optimal attacker invisible. This is impressive result in terms of attacker, but also raises a big concern, right? So even with so small attacking budget, you're able to completely destroy the RL agent. So they're so vulnerable. There is an urgent need that we need to defend against such vulnerability, right? That's what motivates us to think about the defenses. Before that, let's take a look at this very interesting demo here. I have Atari Pong game. Probably some of you have played with it before. Uh, there is a right green paddle, on, you know, which is the victim agent. You can see under the previously best attacker, you're, you know, the reward is not very good, but the agent is still trying, right? Moving and trying. But in our attacker, this is what you observe as the agent actually. So you can see it's like imperceptible noise, but the agent is kind of stuck there, which is quite interesting to say like, but I, like I said, it's very concerning because RL agents are so vulnerable to very small perturbations. So with that, it comes to our second part, which is to evaluate and improving the robustness using defenses. How do we do that? The state of the art defenses are mostly two lines of work. First line is in 2020, um, they enforce consistent output under similar, uh, similar inputs. This is very intuitive, of course, works very well and efficient, but the problem with it is that it doesn't consider the worst case value. So it doesn't have a long-term vision because we're doing interactive decision-making here. What we do is gonna affect the future. And what we do now should be considering all the history. Uh, unfortunately, this method also very efficient, doesn't consider worst case value. Another method, which indeed considers the worst case value, but they're really slow. We know that RL agents are already known to be very slow. And that's the reason many people are pessimistic about RL, but this method actually doubled the required sample. So in that sense, we really want to make sure that can we achieve the best of the both worlds? Can we have a you know, kind of a fast algorithm, but that also consider the worst case 
vulnerability. Another thing is, yes, we recently did a work that estimated and improved the worst case value together with the clean value. So you don't have to require extra samples during the learning. You can use whatever sample you've already collected and then use it for the worst case value. And what we did is to propose the call the uh, worst case Bellman operator. This operator is proven to be a contraction whose fixed point is just the worst case Q value of the policy pi under attack, right? So this is really cool because, you know, this worst case Bellman operator has a long-term vision. You know, it basically considers not only the next step state and action, but the set of action that the policy may select under attack. So this is really nice because I'm gonna predict what actions I may select under each future step with this long-term vision, I'm gonna be able to prepare for the worst, even in a long-term sense. So with this Bellman, you know, worst case Bellman operator, we achieve a very efficient um, defense that also consider a worst case. So here are some empirical results. You can see I'm showing you a worker environment with many different levels of attacking strength, starting from a weaker attacker to a very strong attacker. This is actually what we proposed earlier. So you can see under all the suite, you know, the, the different the spectrum, the packing strength, our method is achieving the best robust accuracy here. So we're achieving the SOTA robustness under many different attacking strengths. And not only that, very impressively, you can see, we also even achieve the best trade-off between the natural reward and the worst case reward. Indeed, if you look at the Pareto frontier of this figure here with the natural reward in the x-axis and the worst case reward in the y-axis, you're seeing our method is kind of outermost compared with all the previous baseline. And even more impressively, you can see the SOTA robustness and the SOTA natural reward and the robustness trade-off is achieved using much smaller time than previous methods. So I think this is really a very, you know, kind of a promising result in terms of defending against these vulnerabilities in RL agents. Now, uh, with this quantitative result, I'd like to show you some qualitative results as well. So you can see the previous state of the art defense is the first row, um, you know, under no attack, under some attack and so under the strongest attacker. We also have our defense in the second row. So under all these attacks, you can see for whatever reason, the previous state of the art actually try to jump with one leg, although this agent is called a walker. You know, it should be walking, but it's actually jumping with one leg. Uh, my hypothesis is probably because they were overfitted to a specific attacker, because they have to actually generate an attacker so that they train an algorithm to be robust to these attackers. Um, so what we do here is, you know, rather than explicitly learn attacker, we just prepare for the worst. And turns out this becomes much more natural to human and more interpretable because you're just trying to lower down your body. If you're under attack while you're walking, and I think to human as well, it's very natural to lower down your body so that you can walk more stable. Right? So this gets like a much more interpretable result. And um, now I, I wanted to talk about something that is my recent vision about how people uh, you know, in the world solicited information. So let's say you are the agent here, right? Everyone lives in the world to have a local observation of the world, right? You don't get to see the entire world. So inevitably you have this uh, partial observability. Uh, but you know, if you wanted to make a planning you know, in this very interesting cartoon here, you know, whether you wanted to make a decision of go up to get the gold or go right to get the bomb, which of course you apparently want to avoid, you don't know because you only have a very limited sensor range. So whether to go up or go right, you simply don't have the solution. You don't have any way to come up with a solution. But we live in a world. We can always solicit information. And this is how we, everyone as a human or not only just algorithms, everyone as a human is also doing. 
we're soliciting information every day from your lawyer, from Google, from your friends, from your parents. You have all this kind of multiple source of information you're soliciting information from, and we call it communication messages. So with this communication messages, maybe your friend agents are telling you that, look, there is a hundred bucks up here, but there is a bump on the right. Now, of course, you're going to choose to go up to get the, you know, the gold, right? So this is nice. Communication alleviates the partial observability. But the world is never so ideal, right? You always have this information, you know, maybe sensor failure, maybe it's just like a malicious kind of cyber attack, you know, under this kind of malicious information, even just one agent being malicious might very well ruin your entire decision making. For example, this agent tells you there is a thousand bucks here, although the other agents tell you there is a hundred bucks there, then of course you're gonna go right because there's more money here, right? So ended up you will be encountering the bump and this is catastrophic failure, right? So. So what I'm trying to say here is that communication and carry misinformation or adversarial attacks. And therefore, although communication helps you in, in terms of combating this com, you know, partial observability, but it can also mislead you. So communication can be a double-edged sword, right? So how do we deal with it? Can we have a robust policy? And the answer is yes. We try to design a policy that is the trust the consensus rather than any individual too much. And this is how it works. It actually becomes a certified defense. So during the training time, you are in a more safe environment. You have all these kind of benign messages you're getting from your friends. You know, what you do is you're gonna do message ablation. So you're gonna get this ablated K message samples by randomly choosing K messages from the entire message set. And you're gonna train a base policy. This, this base policy will learn how to make decisions based on the subset of the information you got rather than the entire set of the information. So with that, then during training, uh, during test time, what you do is still you observe these messages, but some of them is gonna be corrupted, unfortunately, right? How do you defend against it? So you're still going to get this ablated K message samples, but out of this M minus one choose K samples, some of, the, some of them are gonna be purely benign. Some of them will be contaminated. You don't know which ones are contaminated, unfortunately, right? But what you're going to do is you're gonna use the base policy you've learned during training time under the safe environment, and you're going to do this base policy for all the ablated K message samples. And then finally, you're going to make a decision based on the ensemble of the base actions. And the agent will take a majority vote of all the resulting actions. So you're acting on consensus. And this acting on consensus actually is tremendously helpful in terms of making your algorithm to be robust. And here is the result. So you can see if you're making sure that in your system you have more friends than enemies, so let's say you have N minus one agents, half of them, more than half of them are benign, then you are able to get a certification. So you require that a purely benign K message samples are greater than the contaminated K message samples. And the benign samples can reach some consensus rather than everyone disagreeing with each other. They have some kind of consensus, which kind of reflect the, you know, the problem shouldn't be too difficult by itself. Right, so that everyone has a different opinion, then you are not able to defend against the adversarial opinions. So if you're able to make these three conditions to satisfy, and indeed this second and third condition are related to a smart choice of your hyperparameter K. Uh, we don't have like a very detailed discussion about it, but you know, the detail, details are in the paper. It turns out you can have an action certification as well as a reward certification. What the action certification says is that your selected action is guaranteed to be safe, which actually matches the benign consensus, which is pretty nice, right? Your reward certificate says the cumulative reward is lower bounded, actually also matching the natural performance, 
is also nice. So overall, this means that ensemble policy under any attack would perform similarly um, as if the base policy is doing without any attack. So this is a certified defense guaranteeing the benign, uh, you know, the consensus is benign and your actions are safe. So here are some empirical results. So we kind of designed our own multi-agent system with this colored agents with the sensor ranges, the, the you know, kind of black uh, legs here are the sensor range. So you can see the agents has their own color and they can also eat their food of their own color. They cannot eat other colored food, but they have to be cautious because there are the small little dots here, the black dots here are poisons. You wanna avoid uh, running into the poisons. So it turns out we can, using this environment we design, we show that our defense or any kind of algorithm can gain some information from benign communication because this line, this dash line is what, uh, you know, without communication, what you can achieve. So you can see this algorithms using communication would achieve much better results compared with no communication. This is good. You're utilizing your friend's information but you have to be aware of the vulnerability. When there is no attacker, things are fine, everything is ideal. But when there is one attacker, C equals to one or two attacker or even three attackers, then things are very different. You can see these previous methods are actually getting very small rewards compared with our method. So we're able to defend against adversarial communications, but not necessarily the previous method. And also, what's even more surprising is that our method, which can guarantee like certification of two attackers when k equals to two, this is the result of k equals to two. Um, but it turns out when you even have more than you know what you can certificate, your result is still not very bad. Infrequently, you're still getting a very high reward when you have more attackers than what you can certify. All right. So that's as a conclusion for this part, I talked about the robustness adaptation to unseen inputs. And I talked about the robustness under adversarial inputs. As I said, I wanted to use like three minutes to talk about uh, some of our recent work on efficiency, which is a, another very important issue in trustworthy machine learning. Um, here, for example, the idea is to do, you know, realize model efficiency using model um, network model design and interpretation. For example, we know convolutional neural networks and Rose here in the audience has also worked a lot on this kind of topic. Convolutional neural networks are versatile, can be used anywhere, very successful, but they're so big, especially if you wanted to do personalized, you know, machine learning or federated learning, they're simply too big. So we asked the question, can we utilize the tensor representation learning theory to understand how to do model compression in neural network? And it turns out simply replacing this linear operation to multilinear operation, you can guarantee model compression. Indeed, we have a theory, you know, proving that there is a generalization improvement through the lens of compression. Right, so um, this is very important because it might help you in terms of doing better retail learning in constrained devices that your smartphone, uh, not necessarily in this very gigantic servers that we're using these days. Um, you know, you can see some results, for example, for long-term video prediction, it actually achieved the best result using the fewest parameters, which is very impressive. And for this image classification, you know, original retina 32, 460K parameters achieving 60, 93% uh, accuracy, but using 10%, you almost have very small kind of negligible kind of performance degradation, right? So we also use this to understand transformers, which is, you know, one of the most successful architecture or neural network these days but nobody understands what it's really doing. So using tensor diagram representation, we realize, you know, people's common sense that multi-head 
tension is just a paralyzation of single heads of tension is actually wrong. And we realize multi heads of tension has a very special contraction that is making sure the model is very expressive. And realized by that, we even provide a better design of the transformer through some kind of architecture design and it has guaranteed higher expressive power and therefore much more efficient than existing transformers. And um, also we understand model invariances and data augmentation and understand how they generate help with the generalization benefits. We even have some recent work on scalable graph neural networks. Again, I don't want to go into the details, but in the last five minutes, since we started a little bit late, I wanted to talk about this point I was mentioning at the beginning that not only we wanted to have like separately robustness and robust systems and efficient systems, we want both of them, right? So here indeed in a very recent work, we realized that through architecture design by designing this orthogonal convolutional neural networks, you can guarantee certified robustness. And this is really cool because you are able to get robustness for free through architecture design. And this can be very efficient as well, right? So all the existing robust defenses are very expensive, but this is for free, which is, I think, a really cool work. Uh, and finally, um, we ethics, as I said, is very important. Uh, one motivating example here is that, you know, when you are in a, uh, you know, in a, in a society, you design these machine learning models, they have to conform to the social norms, right? We observe that fairness actually collapse under distribution shifts, but all the existing work do not consider distribution shift. They just consider as if like the training and the test data are all coming from the same distribution. Whereas, you know, what you train in hospital A when deployed in hospital B will never be fair. Well, will no longer be fair indeed. So how do you deal with that problem? We kind of, you know, taking the perspective from self-supervised learning, uh, which essentially said that under some kind of expansion assumption, which means that, you know, this kind of correctly pseudo-labeled area is greater than the mass of the incorrectly pseudo-labeled area, then if you have this consistent prediction under the transformation of the same input, you can guarantee that you propagate labels from source to target domain. And what that means is that if your model is invariant to this nuisance factor, so it's not picking this nuisance factor or this kind of a um, spurious factor, then you can transfer accuracy from source to target. And this is cool because using that idea, we derived a new assumption. We kind of proposed a new assumption, which is much milder than the previous assumption. Previously, you want the expansion assumption, but right now, what you need is only within the sensitive group, within the class, you need that expansion assumption. This is actually much milder because you don't require overall expansion. You only require each group expansion. With that, you can guarantee that if your model is fair uh, you know, and is invariant to this nuisance factor, then even if you are under distribution shift, your model is gonna maintain to be fair. So this is a really important observation because it basically means that your fairness shouldn't be artificial. It shouldn't be only fair because you're fair to this nuisance factors. It should be fair for the actual label. And with that, even if your distribution shifts, your fairness is gonna maintain from source to target. And I think this is a really important observation that can guide us through understanding how to maintain the ethics of the model, even under distribution shift. And finally, my long-term vision for this kind of trustworthy machine learning model is that you wanted to not only look at one-time fairness, also look at the long-term fairness, because you're always in a decision-making, you're always in the time, right? So, in that, you just want to make sure that, you know, what you make now is going to be fair in the future, All right? So with that, I think I probably should conclude because we're really running out of time. Um, so today I talked about my research in these three directions in the last three years. We've been looking at robustness, efficiency, and ethics. 
we've been also probably looking at the pairs of them, right? For example, robust and efficiency together and robustness and ethics together. And my long-term vision is, can we look at all of them together and finally have a truly trustworthy machine learning system for interactive decision-making in very complex environments? And none of these work are possible without my awesome group of students. Uh, it's growing even bigger these days, but I've been enjoying every moment I work with them. Uh, and finally, I wanted to thank to my generous sponsors Without their support, none of this could be happening. So thank you, everyone. Related publications and robust machine learning and some other related words. <laughs>